Okay, so I just got a message from a friend of the channel, Castle Bravo, who notified me that the emergency action messages, these are coded uh, cryptic messages that the U.S. military uses to communicate with strategic command, uh, potentially the nuclear bombers. Now, this happens all the time, okay? We got to make that abundantly clear. He said that there was a distinct feature about today's messages that he thought was a little bit off and that the clarity of the speaker of the messages was a little bit too fine-tuned, indicating that this might be more than an exercise. Now, we know that strategic command is at a higher state of alert, probably due to what's going on in the Middle East at this point in time, and we know that uh, recently, I don't know if it's training exercise or what, but that a bunch of cruise missiles were, uh, nuclear capable cruise missiles were loaded onto uh, nuclear, potentially nuclear delivery system planes. And a lot of people are a little spooked about this. I don't know what to make of it. I'm just going to keep on prepping as I usually do. Of course, whenever you have a lull, a, a brief break in the news cycle like we've seen in the last 24 hours where it's been very eerily quiet, usually that means that big plans are being hatched. Big plans aren't being hatched when people are shouting and talking all the time. Big plans are only being hatched when you're thinking and you're being discreet and you're doing something on the low low. I interpret all the big moves that we're about to see Preceding them, there's going to be a calm, and this is why there's a calm before the storm. It's like a tsunami, you know, the pulls out the ocean away from the shore before the deluge and the massive flood comes in. There's this sucking back of the water from the shoreline. In the same way, I think that what they're working on right now in response to whatever Israel is planning is this is just kind of activating all of the major militaries of the earth to be on a heightened state of readiness and they all kind of feed off of one another because they see the other guy getting prepared so we got to increase our defcon level then they see that and then they got a tit for tat up the ladder of escalation so let's hope it's nothing but it's something that i thought i would make people aware of now today we want to seize upon this opportunity before our robot overlords take over. And we're gonna do a prepping exercise that's incredibly important, okay? It plays on the video that I did yesterday. Now, I first wanted to show you this insane video, the progress that DARPA has been making with their Boston Dynamics robots has just been insane. Many people have been sleeping on this, but this is the new version of the Atlas robot. This is not CGI, this is not AI. This is their robot. You can see it's got 360 joints and this thing is now integrating all kinds of artificial intelligence systems. This is the future, guys. This is how we're going to be replaced. We are not too far from RoboCop, it would appear. Now, what I want to do today is I really want to show you guys something that we've been working on on the channel. And this is going to help you to take stock and take inventory of your preps and assess your strengths and weaknesses for surviving the absolute worst of what might come our way. As you can see, I've almost checked the third box. The only thing left to do now is build a bunker, but there's a lot more to that. Now, yesterday in the video, we did a rather subjective assessment to help you look at the many dimensions of preparedness and to self-assess, identify your strengths and weaknesses. Now we've been able to quantify that and you're going to get an actual score down to the decimal points based on this system we've created. So we're going to go through this. I'm going to rate myself and then we're going to walk through this together and you know, you're going to rate yourself and we're going to be able to determine where exactly we fit along this spectrum. As much as I like that people are optimistic about their capabilities, some of those scores I've seen in the comments section yesterday were a little bit high, we'll say, because you got to understand, a person with a hundred, I don't know how many Navy SEAL gardeners you know that live off in the woods, but uh, there ain't that many, okay? So people who are scoring 85 and above, that's rare, very, very rare. That's gonna be less than probably 0.1% of the population, and we're gonna explain why. Now, how would you rate your current financial status 
or net worth. Now, if you're Robert Kiyosaki, you probably have a lot of debt because that's how you get rich. Uh, assets minus liabilities. I don't want this question to be first because in my personal opinion, this is absolutely not the most important factor when it comes to preparedness. Of course, the higher the net worth, the more resourceful you can be in terms of sourcing the things that you're going to need to ride out the end of days. A multi-billionaire can buy himself an island and a private jet to get there. Okay, that's going to be worth a lot. You can compensate for your other deficiencies by throwing money at the problem. But Praxis Prepper and his son did a video response to that video yesterday. And kudos to his son for pointing out. And this was very profound for a, a person of such a young age to, to understand this concept. But he asked his dad right on the video. He said, won't all the billionaires have to contend with the people who they paid to build them all the stuff that they made to ride out the apocalypse? And I thought that was great to see a person so young thinking like that because that takes a high level of, of analytical capability to think that many moves ahead. So kudos to Praxis Prepper and his son. They are definitely on the right track. So I'm going to be on the conservative side here. I'm going to say 500k to 1 million. Remember, this is assets minus liabilities, okay? So let's see what's next. How experienced are you in gardening? What is your garden size and zone? Gardening zone are you located at? Now, we, we give you a map to help you identify what your gardening zone is. This is very important, okay? Because you're going to be able to grow citrus fruits down here in California and Florida and the southern parts of Texas. You're not going to be able to do that where I live. I live in lowly old zone 3, way up here where the soils are quite acidic and you can't grow a whole lot of stuff because the growing season is short. And for that reason, you can still grow food, but you gotta, you know, compost and you gotta get a greenhouse and you gotta control the environment a lot more than you do down here, right? Even on the, the coast here in British Columbia, you can grow a lot of stuff that you can't grow here. So I'm gonna have to check zone three and four. And I have a feeling that's not gonna translate much into points. At the end of this, you're gonna get a score, guys. This is very cool, okay? How experienced are you in gardening? I'm gonna say two to five years. I could probably easily put five to 10 years because I've had a garden for more than that time, but I want to err on the side of caution here. I don't want to overrate myself. You don't want to undershoot either, but you don't want to overrate yourself. Now, I am going to overrate myself here. I'm getting a rural property soon, and on that, we're going to have a large greenhouse, so I'm going to put large for that. <laughs> have you ever participated in hunting, fishing, or animal husbandry? What is your level of experience with fishing? A novice would be somebody who maybe got their feet wet, okay? Maybe you fished, but you never actually caught one. An intermediate would be somebody who fishes periodically and maybe even catch one once in a while. Experienced, you're never leaving without bringing home a fish. An expert, it's not the type of fish you're selecting, the actual size and species of the fish you want and how long it's going to take you to get it. I'm going to put myself as an intermediate fisherman. What is your level of experience with hunting? Never hunted, of course, pretty obvious. A novice would be somebody who maybe has hunted, but hasn't hunted successfully. A intermediate would be somebody who's hunted and hunted successfully. A experienced person, somebody who does it routinely, and an expert, you got your own TV show on the matter. What is your experience with animal husbandry? No experience would be you've never been on a farm in your life. You wouldn't know a, a chicken from a rooster, you wouldn't know a sheep from a goat. And uh, yeah, that's basically no experience. Now, novice, you've been around a farm. You might know some people who farm. You might have seen animals being butchered before. It's not an entirely foreign experience for you. It's something that if you had to, you might be able to quickly adapt and uh, jump into. So I'm going to put myself as a novice because I've never owned animals for this purpose. But uh, I have hunted before, so I think that's part of the equation. Butchery is the big thing there. And then, of course, knowing what it takes to have animals that graze and everything that goes in. It's a steep learning curve, but it's very achievable. We've done it for thousands of years, okay? If somebody else can do it, so can you too. Where are you located at? Rural, within 100 kilometers of a major city. Remote rural, 
more than 100 kilometers from a major city. Now, with remote rural, you're probably going to be scoring quite high. Again, this is going to be contingent on a variety of other factors and then future iterations of this scoring system. We're going to go into more detail so you can precisely nail down exactly where you stand amidst the normal distribution. And it's going to be very cool, I promise you. This is still in the beta stage. Now, I'm going to say rural because I'm still going to be within 100 kilometers of the city. Now, had I selected suburban or urban, it's going to ask me what is the population density of those places. And on the base of that, it's going to give me a score for that category. Also, if you score urban or suburban, it's going to ask you if you have a bunker or if you have a bug out retreat or a cottage or some land. Uh, you know, far from the city that you can go to and bug out to in case the crap hits the fan. Of course, it's assumed that your rural homestead is going to be your bug out location, although maybe we shouldn't assume that because some people do have multiple bug out locations, which is doesn't ever hurt. What is your age? Uh, the younger you score, the higher the points you're going to get here. And this is something that you might, you know, you don't want to lie about. I mean, you can lie about it to certain people, but you don't want to lie in here because we want an accurate assessment, okay? How would you describe your weight? And I should add that when you do this survey, link is going to be in the description. I hope I mentioned that earlier. I probably didn't. But you can take the survey. We don't store your data. We store aggregate data. So we don't associate it with any given person. You don't have to sign in for this or anything like that. You can do it via proxy if you want to. It doesn't matter. We don't store your data. The only data we store is aggregate so that we can get a normal distribution and a readout to determine, you know, where the average is. And that's going to help us fine tune the survey. How would you describe your weight? Well, I think I got this one covered. Physically fit, obese, you know, over 25% body fat. You're, you know, I mean, that's really morbidly obese, but obese is definitely over 25%. I think morbidly is over 40%, but uh, obese is over 25%. Overweight, I would say over 15%. North America, maybe, you know, a little bit more flexibility there because the average. Average is going to be somewhere between 12 and 15% body fat. Lean is going to be under 12%. Physically fit, we'll just put physically fit. Do you have any chronic health conditions? No. And the great thing about this is, you know, you can have somebody who has debilitating health conditions. You can be broke, but you can still check all those other boxes. And so what we're trying to show people here too is that just because you don't excel in one area doesn't mean you can't make up for it, okay? Doesn't mean that you are not going to have a fighting chance. Look, I'll put, I'll put some people up against Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos in the apocalypse any day of the week, no matter how much stuff they have. How would you describe your living situation and your support system? This is important because children, as great as they are, or any dependents that you might have, these are liabilities, okay, especially under a young age. At a certain age, they actually can become assets. Uh, you know, over the age of 10, I'd say, when they become a little bit more autonomous, that's when they can actually serve a function, but nonetheless, they are still liabilities that you have to watch out for. If you live alone, you have a lot of dependents, and you have no support, that is bad. You got to work on that. You got to get more supports. If you're somebody who lives alone, but you have no supports, you're a lone wolf. You can do a lot. You can survive for a long period of time by yourself when you don't have anybody else to look for. But the emphasis here is on survive. You are not going to be able to thrive by yourself. For that, you need people. I'm going to go ahead and click strong extended family nearby. Nearby is important because if you have extended family and they're hundreds of kilometers away, when the planes stop, then there's a good chance that's the last time you are going to see them, at least until the crisis passes over. Do you possess any of these trade skills? Trade skills list. Plumber, carpenter, blacksmithing, welder, electrician, contractor, farmer, butcher, machinist, mechanic. It looks like our IT guy, he spelled mechanic wrong. First responder, military, police, firefighter, medical professionals, radio comm specialist, heavy, heavy equipment operators, computer tech, robotics tech, and yes, robotics tech, drone tech, anything that's going to be useful in this situation, you want to go ahead and click one certified skilled trade. Now, not all of these are going to be equally weighted in the apocalypse. A guy who's a full-fledged contractor might be more valuable than a robotics technician, depending on 
which, uh, which part of the dystopia Mad Max spectrum we fall along. But nonetheless, you know, it takes commitment. It takes a certain uh, level of intelligence in order to have a skill trade. So go ahead and give yourself one skill trade. I'm going to call it a jack of all trades. Uh, not necessarily a master of anything, we'll say. Just a jack of all trades, okay? What's your experience with firearms, martial arts, and security systems? Do you have any firearm or combat experience? No gun experience means you've never held a gun before in your life. Shot a gun before, but maybe you don't own one. In Canada, that means you can actually, in Canada, if you don't know, you don't have to have a purchase and acquisition license to shoot a gun. You just need to have that to go in purchase and acquire one and have one in your possession, in your domain. You can, there's places you can go and shoot with a buddy without a license. Uh, so this, a lot of people are going to fall into this category. If you own a gun, but you have little experience, that's a huge step above somebody who's never held a gun before, doesn't know how they work, doesn't know how it feels to fire one. So you do get a few points. Own a gun with moderate experience. I'm going to go ahead, <coughs> excuse me, and click advanced firearm training. Even this is on a massive spectrum. I mean, the difference between the comprehensive firearms training that me and Rod Giltaka did between like a Navy SEAL training is, you know, complete opposite ends of the spectrum. It all kinds of fits in here and over here. This is going to be somebody who's had actual combat experience, been in a firefight. And I do believe that we need to expand this category a little bit more to address the difference is there because indeed that advanced firearms training, you know, it, it's such a uh, such a huge spread of you know uh, amateur to professional level that we have to take that into account in the future. But for now, this will still give you a more or less accurate readout. In terms of experience in martial arts, no experience means you've never hit a punching bag, you've never sparred with anybody. Novice would mean maybe you hit the bag once in a while. Maybe you've uh, rolled on the mat a little bit. You've, you've got some instruction on martial arts and self-defense. I'm going to go ahead and put myself in intermediate. I have dabbled in mixed martial arts before. I've rolled with black belts. I train quite religiously just with everything. I hit the punching bag regularly. So I'm going to go ahead and put intermediate. I've never competed at a professional level, so I'm not experienced and I'm certainly not an expert in this respect. Now, in terms of surveillance systems at my place, absolutely, I have lots of surveillance systems. That doesn't just mean cameras, that means early warning detection systems as well. I wouldn't really class a, uh, a light, uh, a motion sensor light, I wouldn't really class that as being a surveillance system, but you get the point. These are excellent force multipliers. There's a reason why intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance is so important to the military, okay? It's because it's one of the, the biggest force multipliers is to have that information before a problem arises in the first place, so hopefully you can avoid or dissuade a would-be aggressor. Do you have a guard dog? Yes. Now, I know guard dogs can be liabilities under certain conditions, but we're going to chalk it up for practical purposes. It is a bonus. How would you assess your mental health? Now, this is very important. And one thing we don't get into here is leadership capabilities. And this is a dimension that we're going to have to add because, you know, there's certain people who are just going to be able to navigate a dangerous environment, a dangerous social environment. Street smarts is important, but it's difficult to quantify. Some things are, however, easy to quantify. Have you ever had a drug addiction problem? If you have, or if you do currently have one, I suggest you turn the video off and you check yourself into rehab while the getting is good because those social safety net programs are not going to be there when the crap hits the fan. You do not want to be dealing with acute withdrawal symptoms from whatever it is you're struggling with uh, when the shit goes down. That should be the number one motivation for you to get your act together while you still can. Fortunately, I don't have any of these problems and I also, you don't get full points if you're just, if you're a recovering addict, you know, six months plus sober, there's still a potential for relapse at some point down the road and you're perhaps more prone to relapse and, and going into 
uh, dangerous, uh, self-inflicted uh, behaviors, and in the future, when you know, when the situation creates too much stress for you, we'll say. Okay. Have you been diagnosed with any mental health condition? I can gladly say no. Do you smoke cigarettes? Not for 15 years. What is your level of education? I'm going to say post-secondary. Now, some people might say, yeah, university doesn't teach you anything nowadays, but it's a, it's a sign that you were committed and you were dedicated to something. And you went and you got the degree. Even if it was underwater basket weaving, it showed commitment that you went and finished and got the degree. I would be reluctant to say post-secondary if you didn't finish. But, you know, one thing for these higher education, as much as they might not be as much as they might just be a, a way to profiteer, uh, they do in some ways exercise people's analytical and critical thinking skills, or at least they used to. I don't know how things have changed, probably not for the better. Now, what is your IQ? This is problematic for a lot of people, and it, this is going to be one you're going to have to eyeball. With all these, you want to err on the side of caution, okay? The majority of people are going to be around the 100 range. And we should probably restructure this because we, this should be 95 to 105 instead of 100 to 101. Because, of course, the difference between 100 and 101 is not a huge difference. If you are in the 100 to 115, you're about one standard deviation uh, above average. If you are, you know, 116 to 130, that's when you're getting into two standard deviations. 130 and above, you're in, you know, an exceptional class of individual within society. Now, how important is this to your survival? Well, in terms of navigating dangerous social environments, problem-solving skills, it's going to be quite important. I know because I've taken an actual uh, psychometric test that measures IQ at a university level, I know that my IQ is somewhere in between 115 to 130. A lot of the tests that you take online, they will tell you that you're above 130, and they only do that because they're trying to boost your... It, it, it's sad to say, but th those aren't real for most people, okay? They give you this, this number, but it's not actually a real number because they want you to buy something afterwards. Uh, the Mensa test is a good way to test yourself if you really want to determine um, you know, how smart you actually are. And, and again, IQ is just but one aspect of survival. There's plenty of people who are very wealthy with IQs in the 90 range. It, it, a lot of it comes down to how much you're willing to grind. And you can make up for these in other dimensions as well. This is what a lot of people think about. And I put this one last because I don't think it's the most important thing. Do you have access to resources in an emergency? Do you have stored uh, resources like food, fuel, medicine, ammo? And I shouldn't say I don't think it's important. This is very important. In fact, let's be real. This is the most important what you have on hand. However, you can have all of this stuff and if you don't have the means to protect it, if you don't have the wit to be able to defend against it, if you don't have the security measures in place, if you're not in the right location at the right time, then none of this is going to matter. So I can gladly say that I'm five plus years, easy. Do you have a solar power system? Yes. And how close is your residence to freshwater sources? That's going to be on the property because we're going to have a well. Now, if you have a swamp nearby and you got a good water filtration purification system, that's great. And just uh, FYI, you can get all of that stuff at CanadianPreparedness.com. We have the highest quality survival gear, you know, Pro One water gravity filtration systems. We have whole home solar solutions. We have everything there. You name it, all of the highest quality stuff. And it's stuff that, uh, you know, you're never going to waste your money on this stuff. I don't, I don't believe in just getting stuff and putting it in the closet. You got to use the stuff that you buy. If you're going to pay the price that you're going to pay for a lot of this stuff, you should be able to use it. And we just have over 3,000 of the best products. This is not some drop sk shipping scheme. We ship everything direct from our warehouse, okay? So go and check that out. Anyways, water. Now, you have to understand that you may have a river in your city, but if it's a over a kilometer commute, 
every single day and you're out of gas, that's going to be a big problem. You're going to be riding your bike every single day to go fetch some water, just like Jack and Jill. And you don't want to break your crown. So you want to have a means, a rain catchment system or something. And I guess if you have a system and you get enough rain, then you might want to qualify that as a on property water source. Emphasis on fresh water source, unless you have some means of low energy desalination. Now let's see how I did. Remember yesterday I told you I subjectively assessed based on the video that we did and the method that we described there, I got a 74 I believe. Now here I got a 5.5 out of 10 financially, scored 6 out of 10 in gardening. And remember this financially, you're comparing yourself to get 10 out of 10, you got to basically be a billionaire, which makes sense because there's a big difference between a billionaire and a millionaire in terms of what they can do and where they can set up shop. You scored 6 out of 10 in gardening. Okay, I actually think that's maybe, I don't know if I give myself that much credit yet, but gardening in Canada has been teaching me a thing or two. You scored 4 out of 10 on hunting and fishing, so I got a lot of work to do there, and that of course includes animal husbandry, which will be the more reliable source of getting protein from the environment, but something to think about with hunting. And me and Dean were talking about this, my buddy Dean over at Arcopia YouTube channel, was that nature, when you go and hunt, well, it's a not necessarily a guaranteed thing. Nature has done all the work for that animal. All you got to go and do is hunt it. And I say that it's not easy. If you have technology, it's easy. Um, and if you're, if you're, if there's no more rules and it's Mad Max, then it's really easy. But when you're abiding by the rules, it's a little challenging, okay? But understand that that deer, nature took care of that deer for however long it lived, 10 years or whatever. When you have to raise an animal for that long, that's a lot of work, okay? So while animal husbandry is a guaranteed food source, it's not necessarily the best ROI. Something to think about. Scored 8.5 out of 10 in terms of location. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, I don't have a bug out retreat. I know lots of places I could bug out into the wilderness too. Probably, you know, too many to count. But I don't have a cabin in the woods. I don't have a, a really remote rural property far up into the Canadian boreal forest yet. But I do live in a uh, fairly sizable now rural uh, plot of land with a home on it, which we're going to start to develop as a self-sustaining uh, self -sustaining homestead. 8.6 out of 10 on fitness. The only reason why I lost points there is because I ain't as young as I used to and you ain't going to get those years back. But you can still make up for it in other ways. 8.4 out of 10 in terms of community network. Uh, maybe a little bit high and, and there's something else to consider here and it's the gray man factor. A person like me is very noticeable and uh, I'm not saying I'm like famous or anything but when you've racked up how many views have we got now? Probably like three, four hundred million views or something like that. You know some people they know who you are and they, they might not know where they know you from but they've seen you before, right? So that's why I always say your privacy is an asset. And so we're going to actually incorporate some gray man metric into the scale at a future date. 7.6 out of 10 on security. I got a lot of work to do there. I think I already revealed the survival score by accident. 4 out of 10 in terms of skill trade. So there's a lot of room for improvement there. I want to get on one of these Skillshare platforms and do some kind of collaboration because I think, you know, having, uh, even if you can just self-teach via online, even if you don't want to do it to actually turn a profit, which I would encourage you to because you got to get out there and grind while the getting is good. Things are probably never going to be this good. They're already getting ready to replace us with robots. So seize on the opportunity today. 9.24 out of 10 in terms of mental health. So I'm just looking pretty good there. And as close as I'm going to get on the resources, 9.99 out of 10. You're never going to score entirely out of 10 on this scale, I do believe, because of course, you know, and what that means is that you can get 99.99 .99 out of 100 if you check all the boxes. Now let's think about that, okay? You're talking about Chuck Norris 
an expert botanist, an expert fisherman who is young, who is under 30 years old, okay, who has all of the security training, has combat experience, has numerous skilled trades, has a 10 out of 10 in mental health, has five years plus worth of food, and is has a net worth of over $100 million. Now, I'm sure that guy exists somewhere. Mark Zuckerberg is trying to be that guy, but he'll probably never be him because he never had combat experience, right? So what we're trying to say here is these unicorns might exist, but when you really think about what we're trying to do here, we're talking about a person who's like a 100 out of 100 or 99.99 out of 100, that guy, I mean, he's going to have to do something. He's going to be incredibly unlucky to die in the apocalypse, okay? Myself, personally, I can humbly say my score is 71.94. Now, that last video we did, we assessed that, we predicted that, you know, people were going to self-assess within five plus or minus five of the score that they provided, that that was the window of accuracy. And sure enough, I'm only two points off of what we estimated with our subjective assessment in that video. So it was fairly accurate. So I'm interested for you guys to take this and post your score in the description section below and see if there was any difference between the one that you did yesterday, if you did just do it yesterday. And uh, what we're going to do is we aggregate this data so we don't actually store the data and know it's yours personally. We don't record IP addresses or any of that draconian big brother type stuff, but we do get an aggregate and it's gonna give us a, a general uh, normal distribution of scores, hopefully, and we're gonna see where the medium, the mean, and the, uh, what is it, the other, the mode, the medium, the mean, and the mode in terms of where people fall along this spectrum. And that's gonna help us really fine tune this survey. And then you're gonna be able to get your family members to say, hey, go take the survival rating score survey and see how well you'd fare. Hopefully, this is gonna motivate people to you know, take the action that they need and just show people how vulnerable they are. And this is not to, to shit on people, this is to motivate people, this is to help people. And to hopefully, if you are deficient in one of these areas, you can say, hey, I can still improve in these other areas. So get your family members to go and, and take the survival rating score, see how they fare, and uh, send them to canadianpreparedness.com. That's the best way to support the channel. We don't do a whole lot of sponsorships on the channel. I could come out here every single day and do that, but uh, I prefer to put, put everything into this business in which we can uh, help people here, have good jobs and all that great stuff. And <clears throat> this radiation detector is built in-house, the scintillator, as it's called, not a Geiger counter. I think, is this, I can't remember, did Kai say it was a scintillator or a Geiger counter? Either way, it's, uh, it uses a solid state measurement tool which is far more accurate and reliable. The best nuclear war Geiger counter that's available on the market, tried and tested, made right here in Canada. You can get your medications. I mean, you can get everything. CanadianPreparedness.com, do it up. All of the best, highest quality freeze-dried foods. We just got in some more uh, water filters for our Pro One product line and I mean just the list goes on thousands and thousands of products guys things you're not going to find anywhere else and my whole goal with this is to get people set up and uh, stuff that you're actually going to use because in my personal opinion you shouldn't just buy this stuff and put it in a closet you should if you're you know uh, if you starve for time one day and you don't want to have to cook something up you should be able to dip into your preps and eat some of that food and not want to vomit, okay? There should be a practical component to this. You should be not just get a bunch of equipment, throw away stuff that you're gonna put in your bug out bag. You should have a knife that you're gonna use regularly. You should have a saw that you're gonna use regularly. You should have a tent. You know, you should get to, to know all of this, uh, the stuff that you're actually using. Yeah, so I can't, you know, I can't say enough about, uh, I, if there's one thing I'm proud of, it's this collection of stuff that we're bringing to people all shipped here, no drop shipping schemes or anything like that. Free shipping for most products over a hundred bucks with the exception of these freeze dryers because 
they ship on a skid and uh, shipping those things to the north or Vancouver Island or Alaska, it's just, it's too crazy. You know, that's the one downside of when you live in a remote environment, you're going to have to foot the bill for the shipping because it just, it's too cost prohibitive for us to send stuff there. I mean, sometimes you're talking about 1500 bucks to send something, you know, just uh, 150 kilometers from Edmonton. It's crazy. Anyways, guys, check it out. Let me know your score in the comment section below. We'll pin the link for the survey up top. Thanks for watching. Take care.